This is Don Rowan in Aura Paul at uh, Norwich University, and we're doing uh, the economic diversity and the build environment, and it's a panel discussion with a number of experts. They're going to be discussing this for the next hour, and so we're lucky to uh, hope that you'll join us and enjoy the show. Thank you for joining us for our last event of the 2018-2019 Norwich School of Architecture and Art lecture series, a symposium on economic diversity and the built environment. I'm Talia Stonerov. I'm an assistant professor of architecture here and co-chair of the lecture committee with uh, this semester with Matt Lutz and Eleanor DePonte there. And Matt Lutz will also be helping to moderate. So this symposium, I want to note, is co-sponsored by the Center for Global Resiliency and Security and also the Design Build Collaborative. And we also want to give a special thanks to the Dean of Students Office for offering the generous reception that you'll have after, uh, after the symposium. So we're lucky to have this incredible group of international scholars here to discuss how current housing conditions can be adapted to meet the needs of the underserved populations. They have an expertise that ranges from areas including a focus on homelessness, uh, migrant housing, low income housing, zero energy housing, building codes, and mixed use housing. This symposium then is this unique opportunity to bring these robust voices together to further understand how to make high performance housing in every sense of the word available to houses of all income levels. So to introduce our panelists, uh, we're joined remotely by... Hi, uh, Ms. Sarah Lopez. Uh, Sarah is an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, is a built environment historian and mi uh, migration scholar. She's also the author of this book, uh, The Remittance Landscape, The Spaces of Migration in Rural Mexico and Urban USA. This is in our library, so you can go, go check it out. In 2017, re she received the Spiro Kostov Book Award from the Society of Architectural Historians. She's currently researching two projects. The Architectural History of Migration Detention Facilities in Texas and the Relationship Between 30 Years of Continuous Migration Between Mexico and the U.S. and the Development of, uh, of Informal Binational Construction Industry on Both Sides of the Border. Um, next we have David Shear. David is an architect and a builder. Uh, and an energy modeling expert who recently built his own zero energy home in San Francisco, although he's built many more as well. He started a nonprofit uh, called Minimum Viable Life to support his homeless neighbors in the local communities and uh, hopes to support other communities with these minimum necessities of living, like food, shelter, laundry, showers, and simple neighborliness. So currently, David is also a CTO of Plan It Impact. He's worked on special projects managers, as a special projects manager with Autodesk in building performance analysis group, and in land planning and GIS research. Also, he has worked as a contractor, a fisherman, and perhaps the coolest, a float plane pilot in both California and Alaska. And on David's left is Gina Merritt. Uh, Gina is principal of Northern Real Estate Urban Venture and has over 23 years of real estate development and investment experience, underwriting over $3.5 billion in real estate transactions and managing over 6,000 units of housing in various stages of development. Her recent industry recognitions include Built by Women, two site award winner uh, for National Capital Commons and Nanny Halen at 4800. Developer of the Year, 2017 by DC Noma, and 2018 Washington Business Journal Minority Business Leader Award honoree. On Gina's left is uh, Ms. Barbara Brown Wilson. Uh, Barbara is an assistant professor of urban and environmental planning from the University of Virginia's School of Architecture, where she's also the Director of Inclusion and Equity. She authored Resilience for All, Striving for Equity Through Community-Driven Design, as well as Questioning Architectural Judgment, The Problem of Codes in the United States. 
Her research focuses on the history, theory, ethics, and practice of sustainable community development and on the role of urban social movements in the built world. And finally, we have Alex Chafran. Uh, Alex is a lecturer, um, he's a PhD. He's a lecturer in urban geography at the University of Leeds in England, so he's joining us internationally. And his award-winning writing about planning and segregation and regions has appeared in numerous professional and scholarly journals. He's the author of the recent book, The Road to Resegregation, Re, yes, Resegregation North in California and the Failure of Politics, which is also in our library. Check it out. Born and raised in California, he spent a decade as an immigrant rights and housing activist in California and New York before becoming an academic. So here's how the symposium is going to go. We're going to have short presentations from each of these incredible scholars and practitioners. And then we're going to open this up uh, to a, as a moderated discussion that we really encourage all of you to participate in. So raise your hands, we'll find a mic, and we'll come around and grab your questions. This is really supposed to be a very interactive and lively discussion. So we will begin with Sarah Lopez. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate as a disembodied floating head. <laughs> uh, also, I want to say in advance that um, I have prepared, because I have many slides I'm going to be going through quickly, a little, um, can you see that? I can see <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. Perfect. <laughs> and it has a ruler on it, so I tried to be architectural. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I was already introduced. I'm an architectural historian, uh, but I'm an architectural historian of ordinary built environments. And my work is at the intersection of US-Mexico migration and the built environment. And I have several projects that try to understand the material history of migration. Um, I actually am going to be presenting on old work with the, on the book uh, because the book is um, hold on, let me see if I can toggle my a project that addresses housing as well as other large scale public projects that are migrant initiated. It's a book that is multi sided, so a lot of the research is both in Mexico and in the United States, which is why I have the subtitle of Spaces of Migration in Rural Mexico and in Urban USA. Um, is this working, Talia? It's working great. Great. <laughs> so remittance is a uh, economic term, and it's a term that is simply referring to the transfer of funds from one location to another. Um, as you see in this Guardian mapping, remittances are obviously a global phenomena. The flow of remittances between the United States and Mexico is one of the largest, after China, India, and the Philippines. Um, but remittance also, as a noun, is to postpone, to defer. And because I'm an architectural historian who does oral history and ethnography, as well as understanding the built world, um, it's very important to understand what that deference is about. Why is it that people are deciding to send money from the United States to their hometowns in Mexico to realize houses and public projects for what kind of future? My research um, takes place in Jalisco, and I've also been to other Mexican states to study the phenomena, but mostly in the south of Jalisco and in Los Altos, and mostly in small pueblos and towns of 2,000 persons or, or less. Um, one of the main um, architectural products of this flow of dollars that are coming from migrants who are working across US cities, and I also want to underscore one thing about this flow. This is really a small portion of migrants' income. Most of the money migrants earn in the United States is being spent in the United States. It's being spent on housing here, on rent, on food, on daily living, uh, commerce. This is about saving and sending over long periods of time in order to realize uh, a certain achievement that might not have been attainable without <coughs> migration and that might not be attainable for these persons in the United States. One of the main things being produced are houses. Um, so I write a lot in the book about remittance houses, and I've written and studied that also a little bit outside of Mexico in El Salvador as well. And you can see here that formally they're fascinating in terms of some of the architectural um, features that are being introduced. The bottom slide, the bottom photograph, mm. is showing you three houses that are actually attached um, to each other with a long, continuous facade. And it's the remittance house here that has kind of pushed back, has punched out that wall 
to have a setback, to create a, a cardboard, um, and to distinguish itself from this kind of vernacular type of construction found in that location. But what I'm really interested in beyond the formal characteristics of the, the houses is the social histories and social stories that are embedded in these construction projects. So you're looking here at a, uh, some uh, and this other who are working in a, uh, a meat market in Oakland, California. And the photograph uh, next to them is his wife, who's living in their house in Guanajuato with daughters. Um, and the family has this arrangement where the son and the father send the money to support the livelihood of the other half of the family that is fragmented geographically. So we have to think, of course, about the costs that that, that, that incurs you know, for that particular family. Another um, aspect of, of the remittance house is, is the stages of abandonment or occupation. Many homes are not lived in as intended. Many homes are waiting for years, if not decades, for um, incremental flows to be able to complete them. Sometimes homes are abandoned. And it really is through oral history and trying to understand, well, what happens to individuals and families that allows us to understand what's happening in these changes in the landscape in Mexico and why there are all these kind of stages of occupation. And finally, with the remittance house, we see a, uh, a, an emerging distinction between people in these rural localities, between people who have migrated and people who have not. So we have to think about what does it mean to have access to dollars? Um, what does it mean to live and to dwell within a context of migration? Um, and what does that mean for the families who are not a part of that uh, continuous migration or that economic flow? Um, I also, to scale up, and I will try to, let's see if I, um, I, I also look at larger scale public projects. So not just housing, but I still think that this speaks to the theme of economic diversity in the built environment and where and how that's happening and for whom. So this is what, th what you're looking at here is a rodeo arena. This was built by a collective group of migrants who live in both Los Angeles and Nevada, and they're organized. Um, and this is a multi-year project, obviously, and one that involved lots of micro fundraising in the United States, five, 10, $20 at a time, to eventually approve the tens of thousands of dollars it took to build this state-of-the-art arena for bull riding. And the questions that the research I do asks, for example, um, are questions about how does this material uh, change in the built environment also change cultural and social and economic mores and habits. So for example, bull riding is a big part of life in this uh, rural locality in, in southern Jalisco. And the jinetes, or the bull riders, have become professionalized. So that's one of the changes that has come with it being more of a large scale event. We also see in these uh, rodeo arenas a lot of national advertisements coming into really small places like Seoul here. Um, beer. Um, the government has also supported the funding that the migrants are sending for the realization of these projects, and that's what you see on the left that, that sign is explaining. Um, and then, of course, just that sort of microeconomy of people during these events selling all kinds of uh, goods and having it be a way that there can they can bring a small scale development um, to to towns that for the most part in this place, are still largely agricultural based. Um, and then finally, thinking about what new spatial hierarchies are created in Mexico because of this economic flow. So what you're seeing here is um, two of the presidents of the Migrant Hometown Associations handing checks over to the municipal president of the locality in Jalisco, um, checks for you know the realization of future, th future um, changes with the arena and also a parking lot next door. And next to them are the men who are living in that town on a daily basis and who are the managers of that space. Um, and the question becomes, if they don't participate in the actual financing, do they get to participate in the decision-making process about how that space functions and, and for whom and, and what changes are made? Um, I also wanted to just give you a quick 
quick sense, uh, just two minutes, on, on some of the mirrored changes in the United States that are related to these changes in Mexico. Um, as I was just discussing the importance of bull riding and the arena, I have um, a project that looks also at the emergence of the arena, and the rodeo arena in Joliet, which is on the outskirts of Chicago, also related to a continuous migration um, between Mexico and the US. If you zoom in to that slide, you can see that circle right by um, Rosalind Street, uh, at, which is the arena that was built in the 1970s, one of the oldest that I could date in this outskirt of Chicago, specifically for a Mexican equestrian event. And there are horse stables there that are very informal, that are catering to Mexican clientele. Um, there are those who can't return due to migration. We brought the ranch to bring a bit of Mexico here for our compañeros who migrate and for whom many years pass without seeing a pony or a burro or a horse. So it's interesting to know that there are kind of a whole parallel series of bull riding and also horse equestrian events that are happening in Chicago that are outside of the Professional Bull Riders Association, for example. Um, and if you zoom around Joliet, which is the place where this tradition has really taken root because it's been happening there for decades, you can start to find these circles in these aerial views <laughs> that kind of pull over um, the area. So zooming in here to this image as well, you see some of the adjacencies that this might create and some of the questions it might raise. When you have a chariada happening right against this condo unit, um, and here you're looking from within the, the bull riding and uh, arena over that not too high fence um, to the windows of, of the condo, condo unit just beyond. These are really critical spaces. They're spaces for uh, migrant solidarity. They're spaces where migrants from all over Mexico um, and beyond come together and have a multilingual event, if not an event in Spanish, and where various traditions um, are fomented and continued. So these uh, different examples I've given you, and this is my final slide, um, for me, raise a couple of questions that dovetail more broadly with this theme of economic diversity and also hopefully specifically with, with housing. The first one being how we study the built environment is critical to understanding who landscapes are for and how they function. So for me as a historian, my answer to that is that ethnography and oral history is critical right now. We have to be talking to people to understand places. The second is that migrants' capacity to contribute to the construction of a new built of new built environments on both sides of the boundary is linked to immigration policy and the social, political, and economic context of migration. Um, for many, many people that I interviewed and I spoke with who came here in the 1970s and 80s and came through all different mechanisms and means, formally with papers, and this is not about you know uh, people necessarily being documented or being documented. There's a million stories and a million different ways in which people have come here and then chosen to live here for multiple years. And a lot of the people that I spoke with who came in the 1970s and 80s told me that you know the US was the land of opportunity and they no longer felt that it was for their children. And so thinking about what was possible for a group of migrants who have been here in the United States for 20, 30 years, and is that same uh, realization or, or possibility something that can happen today? And finally, when we think about equity in the built environment, we have to enlarge our geographic frame of reference. Are the so-called working class or so-called migrants able to create viable lives for themselves near their places of work? Is that a choice? Why is it that these houses uh, in Mexico are being built? Is it purely out of a desire to have ties with one's hometown? Is it also a re reaction sometimes to a lack of choices in the host city? And that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you. My presentation is going to be um, looking at, I like to call it shelter because not everybody needs or wants and certainly gets uh, housing, uh, but everybody needs shelter. So um, I've been thinking about this a lot the last couple of years and uh, so my presentation is really a review of um, what I've learned and what I've experienced um, uh, about this in the last couple of years. So a good way to frame the uh, discussion about housing, uh, and about sheltering people is, uh, is often around density. Uh, so this is a, a residential housing density map, which I like to, I want to show it first just to kind of 
show, get some ideas about the numbers, okay? So, you know, 11 is a very low density neighborhood. I actually live in the outer sunset here, which is uh, about 15 to 20 uh, units per, um, per acre. A unit houses an average of about two people. Um, and these higher density, high rise areas are gonna be 50 plus uh, units per acre. So uh, just to frame all these slides, I, I'm always putting uh, the metrics of units per acre, uh, the cost for building the unit, um, and the cost for the land, which are some good metrics for judging how viable these are, how much they cost, how well they can solve this problem. Um, so there have been a lot of very creative solutions in the last few years proposed. Um, this is one of them, uh, a tiny house. You guys are actually building one here. Um, these are actually uh, about 100 square feet. Um, and this is a project that's proposed for Berkeley where they're doing 25 uh, units on a, about a half, a half acre lot. So we got about a 50 units per acre. Uh, and you remember from the last slide, 50 units per acre is kind of on the very low end of the high density range. Um, now we've got very expensive land in San Francisco. So while these buildings may be fairly cheap to build, they're still not insignificant and the land cost is, is very high. So um, I'm not gonna make, I don't wanna make any conclusions or judgments on any of these solutions. I just kinda wanna do an overview of what we're looking at and what some of the ideas are. Now these tiny homes, um, this is a just a snapshot from a few hundred options on eBay. You can go to eBay click buy, um, get this sent to you, uh, you know, overnight <laughs> mail and stick it up in your backyard. Um, so this is a, basically you can see this as an infill solution. So I could actually buy one of these if it was legal, stick it in my backyard, and if, a, if everybody in my neighborhood did that, we would increase with no land costs the, uh, oc the occupiability of our space by 20 units per acre. This is a proposal by a friend of mine. Um, this will never get built because planning regulations, neighborhood regulations, but it's just a good presentation of what it would take to do this, a very, very dense kind of tiny unit uh, uh, type of scale of development. Um, and so here we've got about 300 units per acre in a, in a three story building in a, in a residential type neighborhood um, uh, and the unit cost for that. So just to kind of look at what and exists in the world, we can look at all these other options, these other higher density options. So if you look at a, at a uh, mobile home park, this is actually a pretty high density uh, solution. Uh, 80 units per acre, the, the mobile homes are, are pretty inexpensive. Um, and you know, often these are located um, uh, in more uh, suburban or rural areas and, and people are paying for these with a monthly uh, lease of the land. So the, actually the entry cost is, is much lower. Um, we can look at, at uh, RV parks, uh, about double the density, and also a very, you know, kind of a nice temporary solution, a transient solution. Uh, you know, not everybody wants to get into the uh, monthly, yearly costs of, of owning uh, a very expensive unit. Um, so something like this, an RV park, they can drive away with their RV, they can sell it to somebody else. Um, the RV park can move to a different location. Um, so these transient solutions are uh, uh, potentially something we could look at. So this is a you know, 150 units per acre. So we're approaching that very, very high density solution of the, of the tiny micro homes in, the, um, in a high rise context. And if you wanna get really creative about it, you can start stacking those and get the benefits of uh, doubling up on the space. Um, so this is a solution, um, or an option, I guess, that is actually pretty popular in the Bay Area. Um, this anchor out in Richardson Bay has been going on for decades. And um, there's something called the Law of the Sea, where any navigable waters, um, they can't be owned, and you have to be able to an anchor there for free. Um, so uh, people take advantage of that. They buy a sailboat, and you can see some of these are in pretty sore shape, but they, as long as they float, um, it's a viable home and they can get these very cheap and there's people who have been living there like that for decades um, and in fact um, I, I live there and in a marina um, on this sailboat off and on for about eight years. Um, this was a great solution for me because I was uh, going between Alaska and California uh, about half time in each place. Um, I could have this boat in a marina half the year and, and anchor out or live in the, out in the marina the other half of the year so the real cost of this for me was 2500 bucks for the boat and I average about 150 bucks a month for eight years, so very reasonable cost solution. Uh, and, and I got to sail it around all the time with my friends, which is pretty cool. Uh, so there's a lot of really 
really cool solutions coming out, proposals coming out these days. Um, this is one by, uh, called PodShare that was um, uh, started by a woman, Alvina Beck, in uh, the LA area. And what she does is to um, lease a warehouse space and build these, uh, these very small uh, bed units. And then there's a shared cooking space, a shared hangout space. Um, shared storage and, and bathroom facilities. Um, and you can join this for like 80 bucks a month and then pay a, a nightly fee. So, and live here for a night, live here for people who live there for eight, nine months. Um, and the cost is like five to 800 bucks a month. Um, and these, all these beds can be taken down in, a, in about a week and moved to another unit if they need to change it. Uh, now, solutions like this start running into problems with zoning regulations, uh, building regulations, uh, but she's been able to get around those for a while, and she's got a, a number of these around LA and around the country, and about 97% about occupancy. Uh, you've got other of these very creative, transient solutions like uh, couch surfing. Now, this is a couch surfing is a is a site kind of like Airbnb, but it's people who just have an extra couch they want a visitor. So this is actually a free option. Um, uh, you know, no building costs no land cost, and you can actually, you know, potentially if everybody in my neighborhood did it, there's an extra 20 units per, per acre. So I wanted to show uh, one of the projects I did in Alaska. Uh, this is Homer, where uh, uh, Talia's done a project as well. Um, so it's this, this project in this uh, kind of mixed-use uh, area down by the lake. Um, the area is actually great for uh, residential. You've got a um, brewing company, you've got a bunch of restaurants, um, and you've also got places where people work. Um, so I bought this, this pair of lots a number of years ago um, and uh, put a, uh, built a uh, high density development on it. And my idea here was to not do the normal thing in Homer, which is to build a big house, get half a million dollars for it, and, and move on. Um, I wanted to build a set of places that were more for the income range of people who worked in Homer, fishermen, uh, pilots, people in the healthcare industry, things like that. So I put um, three units, each were about five to 700 square feet uh, on this quarter acre lot. Uh, so there's a density of uh, you know 15 units per acre, which is really, really high for, for Alaska. Um, and it creates kind of a community, you know, it's, and it also gives, uh, you know, it's a very simple solution, uh, fairly low cost, uh, but it has all the amenities people need, and it's in, a, in an area, a 200 square foot footprint, in an area about five to 600 square feet. And it's got some nice design touches, so people can get into this, into a nice architectural experience, um, and, you know, kind of lift their spirits, lift their, their living arrangement up for a, a low cost. And my, my idea here was to be able to sell these for, you know, 100000 a unit as a condo or something, but um, here we run into regulatory and kind of habit-bound uh, barriers where nobody could get a loan for these because you, the banks require that they were comps, and this was the first of its kind in the area, so there are no comps, so I ended up having to sell it to a rich, de rich developer who now rents it out and makes money off the rent. Um, so I recently bought this house in uh, San Francisco after working in tech for a while and saving up some money um, and remodeled that. And I applied this kind of densification idea to this project as well. So I get this really beautiful uh, space uh, for myself and a bedroom for myself. Um, in addition, I built out, I built uh, lofts in all the, uh, the ceiling spaces. I actually have, I have uh, nine queen-size beds in a 1,400 square foot house. Um, took advantage of the opportunities for solar, so the house is zero energy. Uh, and also to boot, I get uh, two Airbnb units out of it. So here I'm actually adding a density of 20 units per acre to this. Uh, and I'm also able to you know, pay my mortgage and, and, uh, and taxes based off the, the Airbnb income. And since this is one of the big benefits of a transient solution like Airbnb, where um, when I don't have people in the house, I can house my, my homeless friends. Um, I've always got control of the house so that I can have uh, people over to take showers, do laundry, or whatever. So that gets into the, the homeless support. When I was building this house out, I, I spent a lot of time hanging out with homeless people in the neighborhood. It just, I walked the dog every day, and so I just saw a lot of people in the street. Um, and the homeless community in my neighborhood is, is 
pretty stable. It's usually the same people uh, all the time. So I got to know them pretty well. They're as much my neighbors as anybody else. And I just discovered that the, the barriers they run into are just so minimal for somebody like me. So for instance, this man, um, John, who lived in his van, he's a computer programmer, and he ran, runs his computer all day off, the, uh, off his batteries, and his batteries were wearing out. He, you know, it cost $100 to buy a battery. He would never be able to come up with $100, so I just bought him a battery. It's $100. Um, he's a computer programmer. His, the top is what his glasses look like uh, for the last five years. He couldn't afford to get um, an eye exam and buy new glasses, so I talked to my optometrist who donated the eye exam, spent 40 bucks on one of those mail order glasses company, and, and he's you know set for the next five years on glasses. So very, very, very simple for somebody with this, any money at all to solve the, these really big problems for homeless people. Uh, of course, having a car requires maintenance. He wasn't able to keep up the maintenance, so he was driving around on basically no brakes. So this is when I started the Minimum Viable Life to start raising money. We raised 250 bucks. I spent the afternoon changing his brakes, and now he's driving safely. Um, but his car was really on its last legs. Um, he was his solution was to live in his van. He had a very uh, he's, got, he's got it really arranged nicely. He's got a safe place to sleep. He's got a safe place to spend the day where he's got internet access. Uh, but his van, this is where he was sleeping. Um, his van was just in tor terrible shape. His hood blew off in the last windstorm. Um, so we, uh, we had a fundraiser and, and raised about two grand to replace his van. And these Sienna vans are a dime a dozen. They, you can get them all day for 1400 bucks. So uh, we bought this one for $1,400. And then, since I'm an architect, I had to get SketchUp out, of course, and uh, design out a, a cool interior space that transitioned for sleeping and for living. So another 250 bucks and a couple of days of work, um, and we were able to build this out into, uh, you know, something reasonable facsimile of a home. Um, and you know, it has all the amenities of a, of a, of a home, with a desk space, uh, space to hide his, his equipment clothing storage, and a little bit of uh, cooking facilities. Now this whole idea of van life has become huge. If you just look up van life on YouTube, you'll find hundreds of videos. Um, there are, are people that are you know, selling their million dollar homes in San Francisco, uh, buying a $60,000 Mercedes Sprinter van and building it out like this. Um, so I, I take this, this tells me that van life is actually a legit way of, of uh, living. Uh, the nice thing for someone that doesn't have as many means is this actually gives gives uh, storage as well as uh, area to sleep, as well as transportation to a job. Um, so to me, a van life is a really a, a reasonable option. Now this is what we're dealing with in San Francisco. Uh, really informal housing. People are finding a tent somewhere and just setting them up on, on, a, on a sidewalk somewhere. Um, now. One step up from that, some cities are creating these for, more formalized spaces, uh, empty spaces in the, uh, in the city where they provide platforms uh, for people to, to put their tents rather than being on sidewalks. It's some way to control a little bit the situation and to, to raise up this, this situation a little bit. And uh, for instance, this Tent City 3 in Seattle, Washington, it moves every two months. So it'll be in one park and then it'll move to another place so it doesn't overburden the neighborhood. But it provides a safe space um, that where the police know where people are so they can protect people. Uh, they provide a platform. So it's just it's one step up from this uh, living on a, a wet sidewalk. Another step from that, this is an artist in Oakland, California, is just using scrap, scrap materials. And uh, whenever he gets a little bit of time, he'll build out one of these uh, little pod units. Uh, so this is a sleeping unit. It's got, got a lock on it. It's got a place to sleep and it's a place, place to store your stuff. Um, he puts it on wheels and he'll just roll these up to places where people are sleeping in tents. Um, here's a slightly more formalized version of that in, in Seattle um, on an empty lot. And here's a guy that's a uh, retired aerospace engineer, is kind of making a name for himself, experimenting with a, a bunch of different mobile units like this, uh, where he does the same thing. He'll build these and then just bring them over to any homeless person he finds. Um, here's a unit built by a student in uh, Portland. Um, it's taking up a parking space, but in, in my opinion, I'd rather see someone living there than a, than a car. Um, so 
Now, these seem like really informal and unsustainable solutions, but you know, you've got some cities like this are providing uh, these mobile shower units. Now, this is a very, very simple, very ch cheap and cost-effective solution. A couple of these trucks could have showers for everybody, every homeless person in San Francisco uh, once a week. Um, so building on that, I'm trying to do my part with, uh, with Minimum Viable Life to provide these kind of final minimal pieces for people that don't have uh, that don't have that storage and, and cleaning facilities. So, um, when I made this card up initially, people told me, oh, it looks like you're satisfying the you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Um, which basically says that, you know, first thing people are going to focus on is the physiological needs, then they need safety, then they can focus on the higher needs, like friendship, like giving back to the community. Um, I think a diagram is really important, and having these really big things on the bottom makes them seem harder than they really are. Uh, they're actually much easier. The people that I know, um, they need really minimal uh, need to satisfy really minimal needs and safety and shelter, um, and they'll jump right to creating friendships, to wanting to give back to the community. One guy I work with, every time I meet him on the street, he tells me how he wants to help me build the next. Uh, you know, solar plant in Cambodia, and he's got all these new designs for hydropower, and then he forgets that he, you know, I brought a sandwich for him. So, um, the, the point about this, and that's the reason that I include the info and talk part here um, on Minimum Viable Life, because I think that's as, as important or more important than everything else. Um, so I think this diagram works a lot better to show that if we build these really easy little pillars at the beginning, um, it's amazing what we can get back from people. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm Gina Merritt. My company is Northern Real Estate Urban Ventures, and I'm going to start uh, the conversation uh, with talking about my company and a little bit about what I do. So my firm basically develops housing and mixed-use facilities in the District of Columbia, mainly but we do work all over the country, as indicated on the slide. We work in Maryland, Georgia, Louisiana, many states within the urban context. And currently, we are building 165 units of apartments, actually apartments in retail, by a metro station in Maryland, in Prince George's County. We also recently finished a $65 million, 348 unit renovation project in Pittsburgh. And we just completed, actually, two weeks ago, had the ribbon cutting for a, for a $56 million project, which includes a church renovation expansion, 99 units of affordable housing, two-level parking deck, a retail storefront that will include a culinary arts training program, as well as a rec center. And that project has three separate owners and three separate financings. And we also had to uh, create 15 air rights lots, which is a whole big thing, in order to make this project happen. And uh, I've also won a number of awards for that specific project because it was so complicated. Uh, we wound up winning the New Markets Tax Credit Deal of the Year Award by Nova Braddock, which is a very popular uh, industry um, periodical. So some of our clients include <coughs> McCormick, Barron, Salazar, they're about a $5 billion developer. Uh, uh, so we actually do work for national affordable housing developers managing their projects. We also advise many cities, usually smaller cities that have challenges uh, finding a high level of technical real estate expertise, so they wound up hiring my firm to help them. And then we work also for a lot of nonprofits, community development organizations, and faith-based CDCs. This is a little bit about how our company is organized in terms of disciplines and the services we provide our clients. And this is our company by the numbers. Since everyone loves metrics, I figured I'd put a couple up on the board. 6,045 units developed, over 7.1 million square feet. We've received 19 awards. We've served over 18,000 residents. Okay, and to cover today's subject matter, 
So we're talking about underserved populations, so I figured I'd give some historical perspective on a few populations that I actually serve in my work. Uh, veterans, and when we think about the history around veterans, they're usually, or they have been in the past housed around their physical disabilities, right? And they were put in old soldiers' homes, that's what they were called. That now is like the medical VA. Um, some of their issues were around disabilities being both physical and mental, and substance abuse. And really, uh, over the last 100 years, uh, there's just been a lack of dedicated resources right to veterans. Uh, LGBTQ individuals, <laughs> some of the history there, which seems crazy, right, is that folks were punishable by death, or, and, and at some point it was changed. Uh, instead of killing you, they just mutilated you, the government. Um, and then it was eventually designated as a mental disorder. And then, of course, even through today, we see institutional discrimination, right? And the same, similar, we, similarly, we wind up with institutional discrimination for African Americans, but that history starts from enslavement uh, through what we see uh, today and sort of after the Civil Rights Movement, redlining and reverse redlining. And so uh, some of the historical perspective around actually housing these folks are right in the 1930s, the government builds public housing, really in high rise, uh, very dense buildings, which lead, which led to urban ghettos. In the 60s, they decided, oh, that's not the right way to house people. Let's put them in low-rise buildings and move them out to the suburbs. Uh, but actually, out in the suburbs, there weren't very many services for people. And then in the 90s, we see going to the Hope Six program, which is a program where the federal government sponsors financially. Um, the redevelopment of housing, but at that point they really didn't focus on specifically human capital or um, related issues to housing, which would include, um, like today's program is called Choice Neighborhoods, and Choice Neighborhoods program also focuses on education, public safety, so basically a comprehensive and holistic approach to redevelopment. Some of the other tools used today are inclusionary zoning, Right, in cities where they say in order to get the right to build, you have to provide affordable housing. And there's also a focus on, focus on mixed income communities, and that really is through income averaging, where people that make 30%, 40%, 50% of area median income, which is a standard set by the government. Um, I'll use DC for an example. The uh, area median income for DC, 100% is around $115,000 a year for a family of four. So 60% of that would be for a family of four making around $62,000. And, um, and, and also today, we see a lot of housing typologies that are dedicated to specific populations for the underserved. So, so some of the uh, context there in terms of people and their challenges uh, today, uh, current challenges for veterans, are similar uh, to the past, but we're looking at homelessness, mental health, and physical health as, as challenges for this veteran's population. The LGBTQ, and I'm focusing on seniors because I've done a project on seniors or I'm working on one, which I'll show you later. Uh, there are issues around isolation and discrimination. For low-income African-American families, they lack access to services, health, retail, and food, employment, training, safe and decent affordable housing, and middle class individuals also have, have a huge challenge, uh, which is lack of access to affordable housing. Right? Middle class families don't qualify for affordable housing, and they can't afford to live in luxury housing. So there's this real gap uh, for middle class families that wind up spending too much money on rent. So as, as a developer, and from my perspective, the things that I think about when I'm working to house these various populations for veterans, it's needing to concentrate social services for that population so that they have access to those services. Instead of sprinkling uh, veterans that might have, say, substance abuse issues in a family development, um, you want to be able to uh, house those folks together so that they can have access to services. Uh, the same thing with LGBTQ seniors, uh, especially around the issue of isolation. 
and, and to be able to be housed with folks who have similar issues. Uh, it works in terms of um, sort of a communal perspective to share uh, what it feels like to be isolated and to actually be in an environment where you get support. Low income African American families, um, their issues are around being housed in better neighborhoods, right? Neighborhoods without crime. Um, they can't find better neighborhoods to, to live in because they're financially feasible. And when they do find affordable housing opportunities, they usually poorly maintain property uh, and redlined neighborhoods so they don't have access to services. And again, the middle class family just um, they're sort of left out of the equation. So this is a project in DC on North Capitol Street. Uh, there are 124 SROs, mostly for veterans. And I managed this project actually for McCormick Baron Salazar. And there are 17 units in there for the from the Department of Behavioral Health constituents. And then there are 47 just low income units. And most, if not all, of these are subsidized with some kind of rent payment subsidy. And at the property, there's a ton of uh, various services, case management, counseling, employment training, referrals. And I had to stick that picture in there of Michelle Obama. Yes, I did get to meet her. Um, so that was awesome. This is a project uh, I worked on in Atlanta, which was a public housing redevelopment. And in this development, 40% of the units were going to remain public housing, and the other 60% were actually going to be market rates. So here's another example of how the middle income is not served. But in this case, uh, we also had a bunch of different services and amenities for folks that live here. And the development was, uh, was a 12-acre site, and it was 700 units. This is a project that um, I won tax credits for in the District of Columbia, which is a very challenging thing uh, to do, but this is a 15 unit SRO project. Also, uh, we'll have case management and counseling, and it's basically a communal facility, so they'll be very small units with, uh, with, like a, um, with, with private baths, but the uh, eating will be in a communal environment. <coughs> so that's why there's no rendering, because we're still under development, just getting started. This is a project I completed, uh, which serves African American families. One third of the units are public housing units, uh, all ones, twos, and threes. And in here we have Subway Sandwich Shop. At the time, uh, Subway Sandwich Shop was the only fast food establishment that was um, that was uh, supported by the American uh, Health Association or Heart Association. And uh, we promised the community that we would put something healthy in there, you know, and it's hard in, in this neighborhood, which is a, a much lower income neighborhood, to get services. So we were able to get Subway in there, so we're happy about that. And then uh, we do lots of programs like healthy living, teaching folks about uh, how to deal with hypertension and diabetes. Then my husband actually made me put this slide in because he said when people see this, they won't believe that that's public housing. And so this is that, that development that's one third public housing. We basically designed it to look like market rate housing. So most people, when they see the pictures, and I don't tell them what it is, uh, they think it's a condo building in downtown DC because that's what that looks like, right? But this is, you know, folks here make $100 uh, and, and live in this development. Some, some people make $100 a month, some people, uh, you know, make $60,000 a month and live in here. I'm sorry, $60,000 a year and live in here. Okay, so this is a project I'm working on by the um, Capitol Heights Metro, and I put it in here as, a, as an example for um, middle class individuals. It's one and two bedrooms, um, but the rent is around $1,500 to $2,500 a month. And if you know anything about DC, right, the average rent in the nice neighborhoods are more like $3,500 to $5,500 a month, right? Uh, so there's an example, where do middle class families live? And in the affordable housing uh, examples that I showed you, the rent there is between $900 and $1,200 a month, right? So where do, again, middle class families live? So this is a great example, it's by the metro, so you can park here and go to work. Um, 
and these rents are affordable for people that make over $110,000 a year for families. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're buzzing. Yeah, we're going to go buzz less. Okay. That, whatever happened was better. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try this again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, okay, so I uh, smushed together a couple things I care about because I just felt like um, uh, I was inspired by the theme and, and the questions that had been sent out prior, and so I, I thought I would just sort of give you what I hope will be a completely coherent uh, string of, of thoughts. Um, a lot of my work, uh, I'm, I'm, I teach in urban planning, but I, um, uh, I'm often uh, confused for an architect, which I think is quite a compliment, if I understand, <laughs> uh, by, by the architects, um, and, uh, and often work in collaboration um, with, with architects and, and think a lot about the, the fields of design as, um, as a set. Um, working, working together. So uh, I'm, I'm always interested in power. I'm interested in who gets to make decisions and what are real decisions and what are fake decisions. And I feel like a lot of times uh, planning the field that I often teach in and, and design um, will give you, you know, three different color palettes, but it's all really the same non-choice, right? Um, and so when are we in moments where uh, people are really uh, getting to uh, to kind of enact their own self-determination in the built world. I, I think that's um, that's an interesting puzzle. And this uh, this um, this uh, flyer really really kind of captured me when it, it first came out. It was right after Katrina in New Orleans, and uh, this group of activists actually uh, they they say they're using a South African slogan, but it's actually a South African disability rights slogan that that has become um, an international you know, uh, sort of slogan for the movement, nothing about us without us is for us. And, um, and it's really about power. It's who gets to decide what happens in a space, right? Um, and we're very good planning and, and architecture at coming in and sort of saying, okay, well, you need my help, so I'm gonna make all these decisions for you and it's gonna be great, I promise. Um, and, uh, and so, um, so I've, I've spent a lot of my time thinking about when we get to flip that, when uh, when you know power can be redistributed, and um, and uh, you know this notion of equity in particular, when we're um, when we're thinking not only just about equal access to things, but actually like building your own wealth, building your own self determination. Um, you know, how does that manifest in the built world? Because uh, it's complicated. You know, um, and so you're all here because you believe. Um, on some level in uh, knowledge, you're either getting a credential or giving them or something or other, and we've all been talking about the credentials we have as we introduce ourselves, so we know that in many senses knowledge is power. And so a big question for me is what counts as knowledge and, um, and how do we think about, and I think uh, Sarah actually brought this in really well, this notion of uh, social history and how we understand um, a landscape based on the uh, the questions we ask and the stories we tell. Um, and uh, this is not a new concept. This is something, uh, so leadership without easy answers is a, is a piece of work that in the 90s was talking about adaptive practice. And we hear this notion of um, ad adaptive, you know, uh, complex adaptive systems in the, in the world of resilience. Um, to, to think about uh, you know uh, dynamic situations and um, and systems and how they change, but the way that it's used in this text, which um, I recommend highly if you if you want to geek out on these these sort of power sharing dynamics, is actually thinking, okay, well when the when the problem is really hard to define and when the solution requires uh, you know some some stretching and learning when when you have what you know what can, can be considered a wicked problem or at least one that is is really really complicated um, and uh, and hard to solve uh, you don't just need technical knowledge you also need local knowledge and you need uh, people to uh, to be driving their own solution making process and that is super complicated when it comes to the built world um, but here's, a, here's a, again a text from about a decade ago um, that, uh, that's actually looking at the notion of co-production um, in the planning world. Um, so 
uh, really in this in this realm they are um, they're defining it in terms of uh, rural community development and they're thinking about co-production as not only um, a uh, responsibility for design of a service of in, you know in this case of, of, a, of a planning process but also implementation of that service so really thinking about how um, we might frame our questions in um, in participation and then frame those solutions that, right that's like not the way things are structured right now um, and so uh, and so that that is a that's a complicated set of challenges um, so I spent some time really trying to delve into um, into this world of public interest social impact whatever little bit of you know uh, pop phrasing you you want um, in the design world to really understand okay how does this happen and I um, surveyed hundreds of practitioners that identify with one of these terms um, and I asked them to basically mark out on a continuum you know from one to ten um, all of these different terms because language is fluid so giving you just like a glossary of terms and as I, I was writing a book at the time um, is, is not actually that helpful and there are glossaries out there that, that we can refer to but it felt more important to think about things on the continuum so I asked them to map out these terms not only from product to capacities orientation like what's the goal of, of the, the, the thing itself um, but also from professionally driven to community driven in terms of who has power in the decision making process um, and you start to see this trend um, between these these different bits of language and then I overlaid it with the um, the language in in the their literature and, and what you know what people say about their work and what about other people's work and it turned out there was these sort of three blobs one being like things that are accessible uh, so pro bono design creative placemaking tactical urbanism mostly just because they're free right like they you don't charge for those services necessarily but um, people of color have been over policed for guerrilla art and activism uh, in their communities so it's not actually something that um, everyone gets equal access to at this point um, just you know business as usual uh, making it free doesn't doesn't solve all, all of the problems and you know a parklet isn't going to uh, get us isn't going to solve our homeless populations problem unless we start actually building beds in it right so we so we have to push beyond that most of what we do is this responsible architecture which is thinking about um, the our charge to serve in the public interest um, but uh, but when you are grappling with um, traditionally uh, underserved communities that have all of the traumas uh, that Gina just told us about um, that generationally have kept um, you know wealth uh, generation from being an opportunity for for hundreds of years um, you really have to think differently about equity and uh, and so there's a whole realm that I'm sure many of you have heard about in the in the sort of civil rights movement you have Whitney Young come and talk to the National AIA convention in 1968 and say um, you know you are uh, you are a, um, a profession not known for your you know kind of contributions to civil rights um, you are known for your complete irrelevance and uh, thunderous silence um, and so in this moment not surprisingly uh, the AIA sort of got it together and tried to start thinking through what what their response would be and much of it was about community design but what's happened is that's typically participatory design which means you're you're heard you're consulted you you know there's workshops but you're not necessarily at the decision making table power is not being shared and outcomes are not necessarily more equitable because of it right uh, you still might get gentrified out of your neighborhood um, and so how, how do we kind of look at systems differently oh I'm doing the wrong thing sorry um, and so in the end I, I wrote a book um, this is the slide that my you know publisher wants me to put in for you all uh, but um, but it but it tells stories of small projects that um, uh, that are actually community driven so if you wonder what this looks like uh, there are a lot of projects out there in, in all parts of the country that are doing this really well. So, uh, you know, communities that, um, that have been uh, subject to structural inequities um, are doing their own work and making their own decision making processes and overcoming um, a lot of really hard issues because, because they're, doing, uh, they're doing it themselves. I looked at eight projects in particular. These are typically public 
uh, micro projects, but they all have some sense of um, of the um, you know an eye towards systems change. Um, and uh, and and I won't go into it in depth because we just don't have time. Although if you want to geek out with me over cookies later, I will totally I tell you about these projects. But I also mapped out the um, that sort of actor networks because one thing that felt really important as you told these you hear these stories is that there isn't just a central figure. You know, I mean, in, in architecture and planning school, we hear about the sort of narrative of the hero, designer, architect, or planner, um, and that's just never the case, right? These projects are complicated. I'm sure you, we could give actor maps that are super cool for all the projects you worked on. Yeah. Um, but it's important to think about it that way, and, and it's important to think about it in school that way, and I think the, the design build work that you all are doing is a testament to thinking about these relationships and, and how, how much that matters. Um, in the end, there were sort of seven lessons from that, that project that, um, that felt important. You have to pay people for their time. Do not ask the low income people that are working six jobs to also come and use their free time when you're getting paid on the weekends to lend their knowledge you know find ways restructure your budgets we could talk about that too if you want um build coalitions is is, is sort of i think captured well with the with the actor networks themselves um but also recognize and we're doing this more and more that that e ecological issues and social issues are are really linked you know climate justice is sort of a new a new concept but it's one that i'm excited about because it um because it, it does grapple with these things that that have been interrelated um and and you know see them more in, in the sort of global environmental scale with the environmental justice work that's always been place-based um uh, you know, uh, local wisdom is so important, um, but I think I, I hadn't really understood, especially the importance of local wisdom on issues like policing and other things where actually community policing strategies are so much better um, than most of the of the top down policing strategies. And there's, you know, there's like that's been proven time and time again. So sometimes we just have to trust um, and then think about um, the micro and the macro in terms of, of thinking about change, how, how we make change in, in different scales. And just to give you one example as I finish, um, I've also been doing a lot of work with resident-driven um, redevelopment of housing. So subsidized affordable housing um, and unsubsidized affordable housing are going through these massive redevelopment processes right now, just because it's sort of like time for a lot of the original tax credit properties to, to get refinanced. And it's really scary to think about um, millions and millions of units going through another version of urban renewal where, where communities are displaced. Um, and so uh, we've, we've looked at all of the different systems that are used for building assessment. So here you see, um, it's hard to read, but there's like LEED and the Living Building Challenge and um, you know, uh, sites and a lot of the different uh, building assessment systems and landscape assessment systems that you're reading about um, and working with and, and getting certified for. Um, and they are important because they're pushing knowledge. They're pushing the building industry. They're, they're setting new building standards in many cases. Um, but they're just starting to think about equity. And they're just starting uh, to think about social cohesion, quality of life, you know, economic development. Um, and so that's what's being mapped here is, is, is the change over time in, in, in these, uh, these systems. And what we did, oh, just to finish up, is, um, is we actually created a, a tool that was explicitly for um, housing redevelopment and subsidized housing that would allow um, you know, groups to build a coalition so the developer and the financiers and, um, and the residents can all work together to share power and ideally to even share equity. And we're working with LISC and a few other financial intermediaries right now to try to imagine uh, what that looks like in practice. Thanks.